Um, okay. So, All right, so um, like uh, given what we talked about yesterday, um, uh, like, uh, I'm going to mention some things about fine tuning again. Um, so there was this question yesterday about uh, like overfitting. So uh, let's discuss this a little bit further because like uh, maybe the answer like it, because this was an important point and we uh, we should like uh, like everyone should be like uh, careful and aware about like uh, the challenges that can face fine tuning so uh in, in fine tuning uh, llms uh, there are like multiple challenges that can arise or like there are things that you have to be careful about so uh, one of the challenges is the data scarcity and this you are <laughs> very well aware of because um, you are facing this issue you have you don't have enough data you don't just this is like uh, by the end of the week you're not going to have enough data that is to to improve your model um okay so maybe you will have enough data to to, to do to have some kind of improvement but it's uh, not uh, like really enough because you have really um limited data at the moment so, um, but even after, like, say you do like uh, really uh, an extensive uh, data collection and data annotation, you still you're going to be and uh, you end up with uh, with a still small data. Compare the data that you use for fine tuning to the data you, uh, that the LLM was trained on. Uh, the data the model is tra pre trained in the pre training. In the print training, the, when the model is learning about uh, that this is a generalized language uh, knowledge, it's trained on data collected from the internet, and this is a huge data. Um, it's like uh, billions and billions of, to of tokens. But when it comes to fine tuning, because you are using annotated and labeled data, and uh, most of the labeling, of course, some of the annotation can be actually, some of the data can be generated using AI, but like if you are using a manual annotation, that means like uh, you are not, however, whatever you do, you're all not going to be end up ending up with uh, as 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 a, as a big data as the one that was used for pre-training. So, uh, so if, uh, let's say after like uh, an extensive period of collecting data and annotating it, you still have small uh, too small data you can use like data uh, augmentation techniques and these like include um like that depending on like the kind of data you have you can use like translation or back translation for like creating data for example for for paraphrasing um identification it, you know when you're using the model to identify if uh, two sentences are paraphrases paraphrase of each other and to do that, you can basically uh, like um, translate a sentence from its original language to to some other language and back translate it. And then you are going to create a different sentence. And you can basically it, it, somehow you can create using your own data. You can create extra uh, database on it. This is just, there are different data documentation techniques. But yeah, so this is maybe not the what you are going to do at the moment but okay this is just in general the other point of course the other challenge is overfitting and overfitting is a particular um problem in fine-tuning because you have a huge model 
with a lots and lots of parameters and you are training it on a small data set uh, like um, this is like in the fine tuning process of course in the fine tuning process you are train or you are fine tuning the model you are training it on a small data set but it has a huge number of parameters and if you are like training all of these parameters you are in, in a big you are like there is a big risk of overfitting basically so you have to try to avoid overfitting your data your model sorry uh, and to over uh, avoid overfitting you have to have like proper train uh, like a possible thing they can do like but this is like a must you have to have a proper train validation split so you have to you split your data into train and validation um uh, data sets and then like uh, you have to have a proper split so that like the, um, they are both representative of the data um you can use cross validation in the training you can use things like uh, early stopping meaning that during the training you validate and uh, um, you, you validate meaning that you measure the performance of your model on the validation set and if uh, the so uh, during the training you're supposed the performance of your model is supposed to be improving right so if at some point the the, the performance of the model on the validation set is uh, degrading uh, you can stop you can stop the training so that you don't go further because that means like because this is indicative that uh, the model is starting to overfit on the training that I said there are regular, regular regularization techniques you can you, you use you employ such that um, you don't uh, to avoid overfitting as much as possible this includes freezing the layers of the model so we i just mentioned that it's a part is a overfitting is a particular problem with fine tuning the large language model because they have a lot of parameters and you're trying to train all those parameters on a small data set using a small uh, training data set and so one solution to to or one way to avoid overfitting is to freeze uh, a, a part of the model so don't train all of it, only train part, part of it. Of course, this freezing has another uh, advantage or another thing that it makes the computation and like the processing power like and the time that needed to, to fine tune the model less. So if you have limited, which like uh, is true for us, is that we have limited computation power and limited time, we freeze, we can choose to freeze a part of the model usually you you freeze the, like the lower layers so the ones that you get from the input because these are the ones that have the general uh like they represent the general features of the of the language and um like choose to only train the higher or the upper layers uh, which are more task specific um uh, you can use dropout um which is like a dropout layer so that uh random randomly the you in the training you the like during the training drop out some of the layers so that like um the model is not going to be um in the training not going to be too um dependent or too uh too focused on on particular feature in any particular feature because you are going to use random dropout uh, you can use uh, weight decay by adding a pen penalty to like any weight that is getting too big. Um, okay, there is also this thing that we talked about yesterday. Maybe um, is learning rate scheduling. So again, the learning rate uh, controls how much the weights are change change during the training during like a one one step one step of the training and uh basically if uh, you can choose to like uh, reduce the learning rate if the model is getting uh, to toward like a, a plateau in in the validation in the loss um uh, the validation loss um there are different kinds of uh, learning rate scheduling uh, how to do how to change the learning rate 
um, as as um, as a function of the loss, basically. Uh, so there is a warm up or cool down. Uh, so basically, like this is. Um, uh, so is so a, a period where like a periods of like increasing and decreasing the or the learning rate in the beginning and the end of the of the training um okay so these are different uh, ways things this can be done to uh, to avoid overfitting as much as possible uh, another challenge we also talked about yesterday is the evaluation evaluation of the model itself because um as we said as we mentioned before um that uh, evaluation of uh, of a language model because language models are generative they um um it's not easy to to evaluate they are not as easy to evaluate as other kind of machine learning models which like uh, maybe they are creating um I have to say, even when you use language model for classification, for example, they might um, have to say there is randomness in what they generate because language has this. And um, what can, uh, like, for example, what can constitute a right answer can be many different things. If you are asking a model, so for example, if you are like using question answering and um, you are using the model for question answering and uh, you ask a particular question uh, the model can phrase the answer in different ways right it can be the it's still right answer but it's, it's uh, phrased in different ways because like it's free to do that and um, you cannot really just uh, decide like what is the right answer let's say what is like a, um, a question like maybe like when was uh, I'm going to uh, okay. Let me use an example that I'm, I'm sure about. Let's say uh, when was um, in uh, when was uh, like uh, when did the country of Sudan gain its independence? And that the answer, the correct answer, is like 1956. But of course, it can it can phrase this answer in different ways. It can say 1956, but it can use like a, the independence year was whatever blah blah blah. And I cannot decide. Like uh, my answer is just to be 1956 because there are other phrasing. I cannot just equate the answer, the output to it. And if they are not equal, I decide it's wrong. I cannot just measure how correct the answer is by using just uh, um, a, a normal e equal um, test, which work for numerical values, but it's not going to work for for the output of language model. So this is just an example, a simplified example to like. But this is like the essence of why evaluating language gen uh, generative um, models is dif difficult. And uh, we maybe will discuss later in upcoming challenges maybe how to do evaluation in different uh, places. Um, there are different, uh, like there is uh, this um, Rages uh, system uh, for evaluating the performance of generative models, and that there it uses like a, a mix of uh, actually gener a generative model actually to measure like how accurate the answer is. So you basically ask an LLM to be, to like. Uh, to evaluate the, the the answers or the performance of like the output of the of the generative model, but you can also use, of course, human um, evaluation. So I'm just saying uh, to like boil down to what it can be useful for you in this uh, challenge is that you can use a mixture combination of quantitative metrics if you can, like if you have like classification, for example, it can be simple. To, to estimate what is the, um, like the right classification while um, uh, I can, and then you can use like metrics like the accuracy and stuff, but you can also use human evaluation. So it's not going to be systematic because like uh, uh, you're going to be like uh, maybe output uh, um, many examples and try to look through yourself 
and see evaluate if they are is that the, the model is giving you good or not good uh, answers or like output uh, good or not good output just uh, like uh, look at it yourself try to look at as many examples as you can and uh, or as many test cases as possible for you to do and as many diverse as possible so different kinds of uh, test uh, cases and what else um and they have to be different from whatever was in the training so that it's not like uh, you don't you get like an actual accurate per, uh, measure on the performance not something like it just what it like if it overfitted is going to be giving you good answer to what it has already seen but it's not um, going to be good with new examples okay so this is just general things um uh from like uh, about the challenges with uh, fine tuning i guess like uh, this was what we discussed yesterday more or less uh in but now like i just wrote it down so uh, any questions about this any Yes, Abu Bakr. Uh, okay, can you explain more about uh, how we can evaluate? Like, do we need uh, much data to evaluate, or we can just use, uh, as you said, the uh, human evaluation? Uh, you can, uh, yes, yeah, as I said, you can use human uh, evaluation for like uh, when you were like uh, testing your model at the end, you can just use. Um, um a human valuation if it, if you it's not possible for you to use like a, a quantitative metric um i'm just saying for now because like uh, we haven't gone through like um system has how to do this systematically really uh, like using ragas you can look into ragas if you want uh it will give you like a what can i say if you have time you can see how Ragas, let me see. Um, so this is what I'm talking about. Let's put here. Uh, so it's a framework for, okay, so this is, um, well, this is for like a rag for a particular, but let's see for, there is also like a, let's see, in the core concept there are, um how to so it also like uh, can measure the performance of the generative part sorry where is it Uh, you just can, can look at it and see how the evaluation for like this is like include also um uh, when you have an a retrieval system which you don't have in this challenge of course but like there is a, in in the references you can see that how they do the evaluation for the generative part and there is a, the retriever part as well um let's see um So there is this one for there is like uh, different frameworks to to do this. So this is like uh, there is no one way to do it. That's the point. Uh, you can find like there are like sections about fine tuning, how to evaluate fine tuning for different. Of course, fine tuning are there are different. You can 
fine tune your model for different tasks this is like uh, and then the evaluation will differ depending on what you're using um to to you like fine tune it for um okay yes sir. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, this uh, I I don't know I I don't know about this uh, but I'll read more onto that. But uh, yeah. I'm I'm asking if uh, can we just uh, use evaluations uh, that are translated? For example, I've seen some cases where uh, for Amharic uh, LLMs that we fine tuned or the Gary thing. So okay, we we can use like prompts to like a uh, list of prompts that we can ask is that and could that be an evaluation for our fine tune or is it uh, yeah that's actually a good point because yes so what i showed you properly is not gonna work like the what i referred to you to the ragas and deep uh, deep eval is not gonna work for your case because you are using a different language yes so that is a problem right <laughs> yeah so yes so uh can you repeat again your 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 uh, your um suggestion uh, yes like uh, prompts that are translated basically so like i've seen you, the you want to, yeah prompts. so yeah so you want to translate the prompts from uh, from english to amharic or the opposite i, I don't get exactly the technique um, since we are doing for example in our case it yeah. is amharic Mm -hmm. So could we translate the prompts, or if they are even in Amharic, could we use those prompts to benchmark the, their capabilities? Could we do that on fine-tuned models, on our models? Uh, yeah, the thing is that, can you, um, of course, if you can do it on a small scale, um, you probably can do it on a small scale. The thing is that if you want to do it really systematically, to like to have a really systematic evaluation um you're probably uh, going to need uh, like um, maybe a big uh, data set or like a good translation that uh, like you have to so yeah you just uh, like a short answer yes you can try that um yeah so this is a good point so uh yeah so the like the frameworks that are available are all available in english so to have like uh, an evaluation um, benchmark for a different language, this is this is um, uh, basically you need to either create it or translate uh, an existing. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, you mean the slides? I was I was just uh, looking reading from. Yeah. Okay, yes, yes. I can take and can share it. Sure. Um, I will. So, uh, by like uh, talking about that, let's. Uh, yeah. So, so good point. I was made by Abu Bakr. We should have had uh, like maybe um, a longer or more uh, um, detailed. Um, session or look into how to evaluate these models because they're using different languages um but okay yeah, they already have a lot of work so um this evaluating the performance is going to be something that you um you're not going to have much time to do that and also like so stick with the i would say it's fine to stick with like the manual kind of um just as i said try to to use as many test cases as possible and try to make them diverse and see like how well your model is doing. Anyway, so the next thing like we can look through is, uh, okay, so this is an, one second. Um, 
yeah so what i'm going to show you is going i'm going to be going over like um notebook for fine-tuning llama llama 2 and i'm like it's actually the code is not um Is not mine, so like uh, yeah. So I think it's uh, referenced in the challenge document. Let me just check for a second. So like uh, yeah. So in the um, it's one of the references. It's uh, uh, weight and biases. I think the website. And they are fine tuning a llama for ins uh, instruction fine tuning. And so we can just look at the code they have uh, together and see like um, um, how they approach it. And uh, that they we're going to be seeing these different things that we talked about, the regularization, the freezing. And, and so this is going to be, we did yesterday some like where we were using like a hugging face um, trainer, uh, library but we used it only with like mostly with uh, default values which is not you should really be more specific of course because like if you just use a default um if i'm not wrong the default is going to fine tune the whole model which is not what you want to do as we said like it's, it's going to be high risk for uh, overfitting and also it's going to be like computationally even more expensive so um Let's see, just let me, let me share my screen. Uh, okay. One moment. Let me just share my entire screen. It's easier. Yeah, so these are like uh, the notebooks we have. So I haven't run them. Um, here, not, not not locally, and uh, running them like you need some GPU to to actually run the training they use here. Um, they actually specify like you need. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so you need uh, an eight hundred or eight ten GPU, or eight ten GPU. So with at least twenty four GP of memory, which I think is not. Uh, for example, I cannot run it on my free uh, Google Collab. I, cannot, I don't have this uh, requirement. Okay. So the first thing that here they are using, um, uh, of course, the um, Hugging Face Transformer module, and they are using uh, W and B for uh, for uh, tracking for experiment tracking. Um, w and B, I think uh, they have. Um, um it's uh, it's not uh, from open source but it's like you can create a free account for for some i don't know for a month or something so yeah so it does the same thing that is like um we can also use ml flow to like uh, to do experiment tracking so this is just like good uh, uh these are the best practices uh when you do any kind of uh, of course any machine learning uh um training but this is just like another example okay so uh so what we are doing here what they are fine tuning they are doing an instruction fine tuning meaning is that they are going to be fine tuning the model using a data set of instructions and and uh, and answers basically so instructions can be anything you can ask your model to do whatever and um to give you whatever answer it could be like some kind of question and answer it could be uh, uh like um asking uh for like um giving it a problem and asking for a solution or asking it for to provide you with a kind of specific kind of text so it's a, it's a generic kind of um fine tuning okay uh so and they are using of course this is what's different from your case is that they're using just english language um data set they're using this alpaca alpaca data set which is um uh so it's just a json file it's made of like uh, let's see 
Moment. Ähm, let me see here. So, uh, so this is how the data set looks like. Uh, yeah, so it's just made of instructions. It's a list, and it has like 50,000 um, example. And uh, it's made of uh, uh, like um, instruction, input, and output. So some of the instructions have input and some they don't. So basically, you're asking your model, for example, like give three tips for staying healthy. It's just like asking the model to give you an answer for this. And uh, this is an example. So of course, I think Alpaca is um, it is uh, actually AI generated. So they use GPT four to generate uh, these examples. I think. Um, so there are some data sets out there that uh, like are like AI generated. Some are um, and GPT four is considered to be very good. So that it's very good, but expensive, of course. So they are, I think this is one example of a data set that's created that way. Um, okay, so it's just made of like um, a dictionary and has a list of dictionaries and each dictionary has an instruction, input and output. And, but uh, we can like formulate our prompt to be like made of uh, instead of like uh, having this three we're going to pass our prompt to just be like made of text so that's what we they will do here so this is like a how to log the data set itself into wnb so this is like if you want to use wnb you can like look into this um so yeah first of all before like doing the prompt thing you they want they split the data set into train and evaluation and um they use like uh, the evaluation set is made of th a thousand um example and the rest is trained you remember it's like fifty thousand, and so it's going to be like um it's fifty two thousand so like more than 50,000 are in the training set and the evaluation has a um, thousand. Okay, so again, they are logging the data sets with, a, with the split to WMB, so just to keep track on what you're doing always. Um, and now they define a prompt. Uh, of course, as, as, uh, like as you, when you look at the data set, there is, like, um, there is uh, examples, instructions without input, and um, so you like okay. So this is a prompt uh, below is an instruction that describes a task. Write a response that appropriately completes the request. This is like the instruction, and the response. Of course, the response is removed. Um, this is like we are going, not going to be giving the model the. Sorry, in the training we are going to be giving the response is uh, is the, the answer the correct answer is going to be given separately um or okay so um there is a, a prompt with with input so here we include the input line and um we can make like basically we can create uh, so this is uh, like uh, the final prompt is going to be either prompt with input or not without input um Okay, so basically our training prompts are going to be made of like uh, applying this um, prompts that we just defined to my our data set. Okay, and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, so to add. Um, so this is, these are prompt. You remember they are for, without response. Um, and there is this point of like adding uh, the llama to model has an end of a string token, OS, um, and like it need to be added to the end of uh, of the sequence. So that's what we will do here. Is that we're going to pad. Uh, 
our like uh, our input with this um is that we like by in the end by this token and um and this is what we do what they do here in this step and uh, finally here they create the full um uh data set which is made of prompt the one we created the padded the output and the full example which is made of the prompt separated with an aos token from the uh, from the output okay um So yeah, so what like token to use and how to formulate this depends on what model you're using. So this is a, like a, um, a good point to be, um, to, to, to pay attention to, okay. Uh, all right, so, all right. So just like uh, going through here, I think this, See here they will do the training using PyTorch, uh, but okay. <clears throat> so here, like um, they are, to they are uh, okay. So um, the point of this section is that they are going to be looking at the tokenizer and tokenize tokenize the input. Basically, so this is the model they are going to be using. They load its tokenizer. They are not going to be changing the tokenizer, of course, in any way. They don't need to do that. Um, and like uh, they, okay, so the, they define the padding tokens. This is going to be used. Well, yesterday, if you remember, we talked about that. Um, to input our like to pass our input as in batches we need to pad um the sequence the vector of the, the input sequences vectors with with a padding token uh, so that like um they will be like in a batch all the sequences uh, all the input sequences are the same size um yeah, so this is what's that. We have it here. No, I don't have it. So there is this, this uh, graph of, of this. And um, and that's what they do. They will do here. Okay. This is just like I'll show an example of how to tokenize this work, how it's going to be tokenized, how it's going to be padded to the maximum length, uh, and defining the maximum length to be 10. Okay. Of course, it can be anything else, but um, uh, yeah, so return tensor in PyTorch, PyTorch uh, uh, format. And they also talk about um, packing, okay. So instead of uh, uh, packing is like different from ba ba padding. The thing is that like um, uh, some of maybe some of the input sequences are going to be too short. If you like, uh, if we define if they if you define the padding length to be uh, one thousand twenty four, which is very long, the input sequences are not going to be as long as uh, as this. So instead of passing only one sequence in 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 the vector, you can add multiple multiple inputs in just one one vector one 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 input. So as we pass multiple inputs as just one, okay. And uh, yeah, so this is something some optional to something optional to do. So it's not necessary, but yeah, something optional. And um, so this is like the function is going to be doing this, uh, adding the token as long as this is less than um, the maximum sequence length. And uh, that's, that's all. 
and then like yeah okay finally once you have you can create you, you can create your packed and padded um trained training and evaluation data set okay um next and this is what we need to use when you're using the transformer for like uh, or you can get to use is you can define your data loader. It is this not for the only transformer? When you're doing like training with PyTorch, actually, you also need to use a data loader. And um, so the data loader will define um, the batching because you want to pass your your um, your data in patch in patches. And here they're choosing the patch size to be 16. So the tensor, the input tensor, is going to be 16 by uh, 1024 um and this data loader is going to be taking the 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 data set that we prepared they prepared before uh, deciding the batch size and and the collector function which is here they're using the default um so they define different uh, uh, data loader for the evaluation or for the training. Um, okay. Right. Uh, so in all of these, these are all the data preparation steps. Okay. Um, let's see if we. So as I said, I'm not running any of this uh, here, but. Um, the the that uh, the input tensor the batch is going to be as i said going to be like 16 by um uh 1024 uh this is uh, going to be the size of the tensor we're going to be using for um for the training so here this is like where like we can see some of the training um finally this is the training part uh, there's, there's, there's like to just see like the examples of like not examples sorry the steps that they went through it's this is all the data preparation step so i'm trying to okay so this is like a step of preparing the data set preparing the prompts and um tokenizing the data uh and uh creating the batches batching for batches from it from from the data and um now we'll get come to the training and here they are going to be using so this is the, the training uh, as i said this we can look at some of the training uh configuration so here um this uh, okay so we have the let's go line by line there is a model name the model id which is a model name uh, there is a data set um a set name this is like okay so this is just like um um this is not our this is not part of if you if you see this is like some just uh, some uh um variables that are defining for themselves it's not like part of the transformer uh that module or anything so uh but let's see like what like some of the interesting ones this the precision you remember we're talking about the quantization which the quantization is like uh pf uh, there are pf 16 and pf 8 if or if 4 so this is like a to save on space, you can reduce the uh, the uh, the numbers, the float points numbers to less uh, less um, precision. Uh, basically, to to save on space, but this doesn't work on all kind of GPUs. You need um, uh, specific kinds and uh, video something like i don't know which like from what version but like okay. if it's available it saves you on space basically if it's not available you cannot use it um so and this is uh okay 
there is what we talked about freezing layers so um they're going to be freezing 24 layers but we you know you need to know first like what is your what is your what how many layers your model actually have so your model the model lama 2 uh, 7b has 32 uh, 32 layers and they're going to be just so freezing 24 and only training um eight eight layers um so the learn this is the learning rate um how many um Okay, so this is a number of uh, samples to generate on validation. Um, um, so it's there are a number of epochs, three as well, the default always. Um, sorry, the default on transformers module actually. Um, so gradient, sorry, yes. Another question. Okay, so this is just like the source. Yeah, this is this is a GitHub. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, what's uh, other point? So the gradient accumulation steps. So um, uh, the gradient accumulation step is that like um, it's instead of uh, like updating the grade, uh, like the um, updating the gradients if for if at each step you can choose to um like so every training step in principle we are calculating them uh, but you do impact propagation and you can update the um the weights according to how you pack propagated the loss function um but you can choose to instead of updating at each step you can update at like uh, multiple steps so um here they are updating every two this will kind of um it looks like if you are using like a six uh, so the batches are of size 16 you can think of like um so it's it will be like um it, it, yeah it's, it's it's as if you are using a batch of 32 instead of 16. it's a double because you are going to do two iteration before you you update your weights um yeah how can so ahmed is asking uh, abdurrahman is asking how how can i decide determine the number of players that they should be it should be trained uh okay so there is no right answer um just one answer uh it could be this is a choice just remember that uh, to avoid um you have like to avoid overfitting uh, you can in principle you can train the whole you freeze none freeze zero and train the whole model but because you are using really a tiny tiny data set uh, and even if you're not using a super tiny data set still you are at risk of overfitting if you train the whole model uh, another issue with training the whole model is that it's going to take more time and more computation power, basically, to to do uh, to do the fine tuning. So you have to freeze some layers, of course. Um, uh, how how many like to freeze? Do you, do you freeze all? If of course there is also the, the on the other extreme, you can freeze the whole base model and train only at the head. Okay, uh, if you remember what we talked about, the base model and the head, um, you can just freeze all the layers and keep only the head. Um, and of course, this is going to be quicker and less fine tuning, but then your base model is not actually acquiring any knowledge if you do that. So, so you have to like make some kind of choice. So eight seems like eight layers, seems like reasonable. You can, I don't know, um maybe with trials uh trial and error try to to see like what produces the best uh, kind of um uh performance another thing that you have to keep in mind is that instead of freezing freezing is just one one thing you can do another thing you can use is you can use the adapter adapters you can use LoRa or like other 
um, types of uh, PFT, like uh, performance uh, efficient fine tuning. In those cases, you don't need to, you freeze all the layers, but what you do is you add extra parameters. There are few. You add them on top, basically, and um, and train those. So you can, instead of um, choosing to see how many layers to freeze, you can just use LoRa instead uh, and see how well your model is going to perform. If you have, of course, like uh, you, you should, I think, I, sh I should say, you should try like multiple ways to train. You should try like multiple, maybe if you could. Yeah, OK, so you don't necessarily need to just try multiple models. But um, use, use trial and error to see like what is what, what and like see how well your model performs um, in each case. So does this answer your question, Abdurrahman? I don't know, I can, okay, thank you. All right, uh, so yeah, so this is a graded accumulation. It simulates bigger batch. Um, so this is a batch size as we uh, already talked about. Um, there is gradient checkpointing. Okay, so this is like, it's go you are going to be saving, you can save like uh, at a, uh, at, 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 uh, like a specific point in the training, you can save um your your like your parameters what you achieved and you basically you can restart from the checkpoint um so you can freeze so they, they are like uh, here they're defining that they're going to freeze the embedding so if you remember there is the embedding layer that were like at the input when the input gets into your model the first thing that happens is sorry thing that you face is the embedding layer and you can choose to train your embedding, especially if you are defining a new tokenizer to your model, you have to train your embedding because you are starting with new with new words that uh, new tokens that your model haven't trained uh, in an embedding for. So you need to 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 um, to to train the embedding model in that case. But if you are using the same tokenizer as the one that the model um, the tokenizer of the model without any modification, you can freeze the embedding. It's going to be, um, uh, it's just one layer, so it, it's not expensive to train it. And uh, you gain a little bit of, of space or time by freezing it. Uh, you can use a seed to just make your, um, your like, uh, more, uh, sorry. More de de deterministic, um, like the okay. So you, you know what the C's are used for. Anyway, so um, so the total number of steps, training steps, are going to be the number we talked about the training steps before yesterday. But it's just basically um, it's going to be the number of epochs, the number of iterations is going to be uh, the the train is going to over the training set. Um, and then the number of batches, but then we are going to divide, divide by the graded accumulation steps, as we mentioned before. Um, this, uh, uh, because like when you choose to, how many iterations you're going to go through before you update. So yeah, this is the formula. And um, finally, they are going to, okay, they finally are loading the model itself. And they are using the parameters they defined here. Um, so the model ID is this number to uh, the device map here. Did they define it here? Okay, so um, um, they are using like okay torch data type again. This is for like uh, the the quantization and then uh, okay so these are just they are uh, loading the model itself uh, so the counts of the parameters so this is like um, maybe let me actually show you this part 
so freezing the so this uh, before we just they they said we are going to freeze um 24 but the actual freezing how is going to happen is uh, is here that you go through the parameters of the model and then um basically freeze like they are freezing everything so here like uh, parameters of the model requires gradient so these are all the parameters of the model they set uh, that it requires gradient that means it like it can be updated or not and they're setting everything to false so it's not going to be updated but then they are going to be um uh, uh the head so head parameter so this is like uh, you remember like um the model head they are going to unfreeze it and they also going to go through the model layers uh up to like um, from 24 to the end and they're going to unfreeze those parts so they freeze the whole model first and then they unfreeze the head and the and the, uh, the layers from 24 to to 32 um and they also here they freeze the embedding okay at this point yeah yes uh, like why 24 why this is just a choice it's oh, not okay. anything it's a choice they like uh, they chose that the, the model has 32 layers they chose to just to, to like freeze so if you want, so the, the important point here is that if you want to freeze layers from your model, you should really freeze the lower layers and uh, and update the upper layers. That's what matters. Like this is like what you have to keep in mind. But how many you freeze or unfreeze, this is up to you, basically. Just, uh, yeah. Again, it's a balance of uh, uh, avoiding overfitting. So you should freeze a part of the model uh, to avoid overfitting and also freezing the part of the model uh, is going to be like uh, reduce the computational time you need for fine tuning or oh, we are really over time sorry um okay so um like i wanted to maybe show you this a little bit this one for a moment how the layers look like uh I have it here somewhere. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the Okay, uh, so here, so this is actually, okay, so this is Gary's, but yeah, just looking at, um, after loading the model, looking at the model modules, you can see the content of your model. So, um, so these are all the layers, not, not, not the 32. So 32 is like, um, um it's in, in blocks i think uh but these are like the total everything that is your model you can look at it like that using a uh, model but here you can use layers i think oh how it was this defined yeah so it's actually layers so we have to use model model layers to to look at the number of layers and what kind of layers we have so yeah uh so yeah so i call it in transit here local locally i cannot show you the number of parameters but it's like a, a big number but um the parameters and the train number parameters but they're going to be like um i don't know if it was like a, a small percentage of the not super small but like um, only a percentage of the para of the total parameters in the model are trainable and uh okay just let's go again uh, this is what we um, 
um, discussed yesterday, the optimizer, and then you have the this learning learning late scheduling. As we said, this is one of the ways to reduce your over overfitting. Here they are using um, cosine scheduler. Um, there are linear, um, uh, and you can actually look at the definition of how they have they work. But okay. Um, the learning rate uh, they defined it already two to the by ten to the power of minus four. The betas you don't touch the betas. These are just conventional, not conventional. This is how like they are defined. You don't touch those. Um, okay, so this is up to the defining of the optimizer, and then they define the loss function. This is important. The loss function is the cross entropy um, from uh, so x is so x x and y so x is going to be like um, the output and and y is a, is a truth ground truth which is like the actual like the output from your data set and um, but it's going to be the um, yeah so Okay, so he's here it's just defined with like two two yeah, so it's just cross entropy. Here they are not defining which exactly is going to be. Um yeah. All right, yes to uh, yeah, because we are over time. I'm trying to choose what to explain, but uh okay, this was like um I really wanted to go through so Okay, what we are looking through right now is uh, detailed. Uh, they are using PyTorch to do the training in this case again. But um, as we said, uh, transformers and there is um, okay, there is okay, there is an, another uh, notebook they have. They are using LoRa and. Uh, but like so i was going through the first one which was using this pytorch but you can use also the the, the trainer uh, module from what happened sorry something is let's see Okay, so using uh, this um, module from Hugging Face, doing the same kind of training with the same kind of uh, of, of um, options, uh, but instead here they're going to be so they're doing the same thing, freezing the, the layers the same way, um, but here they instead of using their own defined, they're using training argument. This is just um, um, a functionality from from transformer um mo module and they define the training parameters here um and then they use the sft trainer okay they do, to define the trainer with the training data set the evaluation data set uh setting um the arguments the training arguments and uh and formatting so here you don't even need to actually go through so you create this create prompt if you remember we applied it ourselves to the training that i said there but here you can just pass it to the sft trainer which is a, um i think it's like abbreviation for but it's like fi for fine tuning basically and um so yeah so here you just like the training is just done in this one line right and this extra WMV, these are for logging. Um, and and basically that's it. So here, like one 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 notebook is doing this by using PyTorch. So in just going into detail. So this is like you see, this is a training step, and then you go through the the training batch by batch, and um, um so you pass the patch to to the gpu and then you do like calculate the loss do the back propagating and actually do the steps of updating the weights but all of these you see all of these lines are done here 
system. This is one line, just after you pass the training arguments. Um, in the last uh, uh, here, so this is Laura. Sorry if I'm taking more time, but I just want to show you that. So yeah, so we're preparing the data set in the same way. So each notebook of those, like um, they are doing the same thing, uh, using the same data set. Here, um, so these are different parameters now. Okay, so um, again, they're using quantization and they're using learning rate, uh, scheduler type, this is the same thing as before. So we have, again, we're using the optimizer of Adam, which is like um, the default uh, learning rate um, and a scheduler. Again, this is something you define to avoid, to help avoid overfitting. Um, there is a gradient accumulation steps as before. So what is different here, as if, if you look around, there is no, um no freezing no no what to freeze and what to not here um and if you look through they're not going to be freezing any layers because here we're going to they're going to be using um laura and let's see how where they define when was it defined so it should be p e f t so here so yeah this is the extra thing you define is this LoRa configuration. And um, so PFT configuration, this is like from PFT module from, again, hugging face. Um, and then like you define the rank of the, of, the, of the matrix. I think it's conventional to use, um, um, okay, so, um, so the numbers are like you can start with the, um, with the like, um, with the like what is. Uh, there is a convention to start with, and then you can and you can basically try to 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 variate later after it's yes or what? Okay, so uh, I. I thought my understanding was PFT and Laura are different. Now it seems like they are the same. I, I, PF, no, like, no. I, I didn't get it. Okay, so PFT is a general thing. Laura is just one specific uh, kind of PFT. So PFT is performance efficient fine tuning. And there are multiple, uh, so it uses adapters adding adapters to your to your model and training them instead of training the whole model but there are different ways to do this lora is just one of them it's low rank uh, yeah so yes. by by choosing lora to train our model we are using pet means this means where we are using pet yes parts. so you are using the pf oh, sorry it's not here let's see Yes, I want to show you the, you can look at yourself, but yeah, EFT. So you can see here, um, the, so it's a library for uh, efficiently adapting large pre-trained pre models for various other applications. So it's just for fine tuning. Um, and you can see there are, so, So the adapters there are different kinds. So LoRa is just one, but there are different uh, there are other ones. So it's just it's not um, it's not one thing. So this one is one of the PFT PEFT methods. Um, it's it's one of them. So yeah, it's not really. Um, a read more about, about it to to like understand the basics or or how it works. Um, so here, um, yeah. So what is important here is that to uh, to define the task type. So it uh, it calls all LM because it's um, this is a kind of model we are loading the kind of head we're using. So it's um, the just generative model 
uh, this is the one where we are we're fine tuning here and then the target modules these are the kind of layers you want to apply the LoRa to and here you can see these are the Q, K and V projections um, if you remember this is a query key and value from the, the in each transformer block in the multi-head attention you have this uh, weight uh, uh, matrices and and so these are the layers where the LoRa is going to be applied to um, if you remember again we just explained it very briefly is that uh, LoRa it just takes a huge um, so these uh, these matrices are like one 1024 by 1024 or like depending on what is the embedding actually of the model actually i'm not sure what is the embedding uh, size of the llama too but uh, if say it's uh, embedding is usually huge um it's a huge vector and then uh, instead of this so you are going to add to this matrices of rank 64 so reducing from whatever huge size of these of these matrices and the huge size means like the huge number of weights that need to be updated and instead of those you add only like um so if you are the rank is 64 and uh, that means that uh, like you really reduce by a huge amount um the, the like the number of parameters that need to be trained so that's why with LoRa you don't need to you still like uh let's see the steps actually can see like there is no there is no freezing in this um notebook uh just i wanted to see like how the steps go we didn't miss anything so yeah what happened is that we got the, they got the data set here they define the prompt uh, the, and uh, the and them okay the model this is LoRa configurations the number of batches and uh, epochs um okay so this is the training arguments are here and then they define the trainer with all these previously defined configurations and um just did the training basically that's it so uh i'm sorry to take so much over extra time and um i am also like uh, yeah yes yeah, so what so i i, I saw that uh, it's, it's using uh, sft trainer from trl yeah. yes and, uh, i think it does the from hugging face yes so like what's the difference uh, using sft trainer and uh, a a trainer that is found in transformers library uh yes. <sighs> Yeah, I don't know if there is actually a significant difference. It's just like how they um, uh, like yeah, this 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 this, this, this one um, from hugging face. I don't think there is. I my understanding is that there is not really um, a big difference between them. Like how to use it. Just like some options are. Um, so yeah. It's here, like, um, there is, like, a, the, it has just, like, more functionality. Like, you can add the PFT, the LoRa, you can use the Accelerate, which one that you, when you use, like, distributed training. Uh, uh, it's it's uh, built on top of Transformers library. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just like a, an interface that is easier to deal with. You can, of course, you see, the thing is, you can actually do the training if you really want. And if you're really proficient in using PyTorch, you can just write everything in PyTorch. And don't actually think about hugging face at all. Um, you can you can completely load your model, your all your parameters down and just use PyTorch to write everything. But you're just going to be writing a lot of lines and defining a lot of um, like uh, configurations while uh, 
transformer and TRL, it's even simpler to handle things. They're going to be writing less lines and and there are a lot of things that are defined by default that you don't really need to change, um, especially if you're like in your first trials. So yeah, so this, this is like, a, it's just like a easier to, it's more convenient, um, let's say. Convenient is it to use. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, any other questions? So um, the notebooks, uh, like Abu Bakr already um, shared the the, the the repo, but you can also find the, the, they have this. Uh, sorry, they have articles actually explaining. So if you really, I just did. Uh, maybe short explanation if you want to go into details you can look at these articles so there are three parter each one explaining the the corresponding notebook so you can just follow along and understand these things in more details and look for like maybe more um references if you want uh yeah that's it so any other questions Okay, because we're really over time, let me just stop here. And so we can continue.